What a beautiful sight. I want to welcome each of you to the 2015 Nazareth College Commencement Ceremony. To, today we celebrate our 88th commencement, welcoming 500 new baccalaureate degree recipients, 250 master's degree recipients, and 48 doctoral degree candidates into the family of Nazareth of alums, a family that numbers well over 30,000. We're here to recognize the accomplishments of the members of the graduating class as they move into the next phase of their lives. It is clear that you, the graduates, have arrived at this day through your own hard work. But along the way, you had the assistance of two important groups who played a vital role in helping you achieve your goals. The first group includes your families and friends who have provided much needed love, guidance, and support. The second group is the Nazareth faculty and staff members who have guided you, coached you, and challenged you both in and outside the classroom and by their example. Their dedication to your learning and discovery and to your success is at the core of what our college provides. So I ask the members of the class of 2015 to stand now and give a very warm round of applause to these two important groups and a special applause for all the moms celebrating this Mother's Day. Please rise and give a round of applause. Now that the class has offered its thanks, you can I want to add my congratulations to the members of the class of 2015. With your degrees today, you're entering into an elite group. In the United States, only about 30% of adults have a bachelor's degree, and only 10% have a degree beyond the bachelor's. You have worked diligently over the past years, and your successes have brought credit to you and honor to the college. The program says that I now will give my charge to the graduating students, and this is the time when many of you begin to fade out and check or send messages. So I'm well aware that I should keep my charge short and to the point. So here it is. Slow down. Yes, my message to each of you, indeed to all of us, is that we should slow down. My idea for the message comes from a book I'm reading called Speed Limits, which is written by Mark Taylor, a professor at Columbia. There, D Taylor details how our obsession with speed emerged over time and is now consuming us. Every one of us has witnessed some aspects of the speed culture, and I'm as guilty as the next person. In fact, when I sat down to write this speech, I got very annoyed because my computer seemed too slow to boot up. Of course, if I had actually bothered to measure the time differential, I would have found that it probably was only seconds longer than usual. As I was writing, I also found that I was regularly interrupting myself to check my emails. And speaking of emails, it drives my wife crazy that I stop every two aisles in Wegmans to see if any new messages arrived, as if it really mattered if I waited until after the serials to read my phone. Also, with respect to messages, I'm willing to bet that I'm not the only one in the auditorium who see, checks his messages even before eating breakfast. The speed culture not only has us constantly checking our mobile devices, but it creates expectations that we will respond immediately to the sender. Like many others, I get messages at all hours of the day and night, seven days of week, and the sender wants a response. Indeed, sometimes I wonder if the sender thinks I keep my mobile device on my pillow, just waiting for the signal that a message arrives so they can jump up from a sound sleep to respond. Technology, of course, has fueled this preoccupation with speed, and technology itself is changing at a rapid rate. I recently saw this amazing news story about a device that's being designed, which is a wristband. When you shake your wrist, a holographic display appears on the forearm, and you can actually send messages, send emails, make phone calls by typing on your forearm. When you shake your wrist, the, the holographic display disappears. Just think, just think of all the time it saves from actually having to, having to reach in your pocket or purse to get your mobile phone. 
It's important to stress, however, that the speed culture extends well beyond our technology into every aspect of our lives. As Taylor states in his book, quote, speed has become the measure of success. Faster chips, faster computers, faster networks, faster connectivity, faster news, faster communication, faster transactions, faster delivery, faster product cycles, faster brains, faster kids, and faster lives. According to the gospel of speed, he observes, the quick inherit the earth. The focus on speed begins earlier and earlier. A while back, I had my first encounter with the so-called faster kid. A close friend's grandson was applying for daycare in a prestigious school in New York City. He asked if I would write a reference letter on behalf of his grandchild. Now, this four-year-old was cute, and I enjoyed throwing a ball at him, which, by the way, he rarely caught. But what can one say about a four-year-old who was starting his high-speed chase to the right college? It is clear that the speed culture takes a toll in a variety of ways. Indeed, we know that it even kills and causes injuries. I just saw statistics indicating that over 3,000 people are killed each year and 400,000 injured because of distracted driving. Needless deaths and injuries caused by people who are in such a rush that they could not wait to check their messages or send a text or send an email. But here's the terrible irony, according to Taylor. With all the speed, we seem to have less time. As he writes, with everything in motion and everything on the move, there's never enough time for anything. The faster we go, the less time we have, and the less time we have, the faster we think we have to go. So I say, slow down. Yes, let's put the speed dial on pause. I'm probably as much of a victim of the speed culture as anyone, but I find I do my best thinking when I go for a run on my own. The speed dial is on pause, no phone, no emails, no texts, just time for thinking and reflecting or simply enjoying the scenery and the day. In past days, we often were told that we should take time to smell the roses. The need to slow down, however, is about more than stopping to appreciate the flowers. Taylor concludes that we are at a tipping point, that the speed culture has repressed certain values, and we must take time to revisit those values, which include, in his words, commitment to the whole, relationships, community cooperation, generosity, patience, subtlety, deliberation, analysis, complexity, uncertainty, leisure, and reflection, above all, reflection. So I was going to end this speech with a video which would have been my first multimedia commencement speech. It is a video of Simon and Garfunkel singing the 59th Street Bridge song, also known as the Feeling Groovy song. Wiser minds reminded me that most of you have never heard of Simon and Garfunkel, and so instead I will read the song, and I certainly won't sing it. In the words, it's a short song, but the words are, slow down, you move too fast, you gotta make the morning last, just kicking down the cobblestones, looking for fun and feeling groovy. Hello, lamppost, what you knowing? I've come to watch your flowers growing. Ain't you got no rhymes for me? do and do feeling groovy. Got no deeds to do, no promises to keep. I'm dappled and drowsy and ready to sleep. Let the morning time drop all its petals on me. Life, I love you, all is groovy. Congratulations and my very best wishes to each of you.